Here's part 11 of our conversation with Bill Champlin. I'm John Bowden from Rocky History Music. I heard a story where I think it was Pat Leonard was having a, a party at his house and had a little baby, you know, a little girl about a year and a half old, a little small baby. Yeah. And, and there happened to be, you know, you know, not just the musician cast, because if there was, it just everybody would be having a ball and, you know, let me get another burger and let's talk it out, you know, let's talk about it, you know. But it was like actors and everybody was working, every talking to everybody, looking over their shoulder and this, that, and the other thing. But the king of us all, Jack Nicholson, was down playing with the baby playing with the baby's toys and having a ball hanging with the baby. He was just like kneeling or just sitting, you know, cross-legged on the floor playing with the baby and the baby was having a gas with this guy, you know, and he wasn't paying Why do you attention. think that wasn't enough for him? Why do you think that him of all people, he didn't have to he, prove anything? He didn't have to do anything. He's Jack Nicholson, you know? I mean, he didn't particularly give a shit what people think of him. That's one of the reasons why he was as good as he was. But anyway, back to this Nicholson thing. Yeah, sorry. Nicholson's down on the floor with this little girl playing and somebody comes up and says hey hey jack if she seems you know she you know she might be a little you might be a little old for her and he looks up and he says that's not what she says <laughs> it's just yeah, take a shot at the champ why don't you <laughs> you know oh you yeah gotta, good luck oh my yeah, god it's not what she says oh, <laughs> just a, one of my favorite stories about about Somebody who's really big, who's just, you know, just normal cat. You know what I mean? Gloria Baldazzi asks, has there been a, Bill, a piece of equipment that's made the most difference in your life? Just a, a keyboard or guitar or whatever it might be? Oh, Hammond B3 and Leslie, please. <laughs> that, that thing, I mean, I remember where I was, I, where I was driving with my mom. And those, these are, this is the day where AM radio was, that was it. It's all you had. And I was driving with my mom and they played... Walk on the Wild Side Part Two by Jimmy Smith and Oliver Nelson. And I just, when I heard it, I went, whatever that is, I got to have it, you know. So I took whatever job I could get to make the make the payments on this organ. I was pulling people's weeds. I was doing anything I could do to get this Hammond organ. And I got, I didn't get the B3 first. I got an A100, or not an A, I think an M, smaller, smaller unit, you know. And, uh, and a little smaller Leslie and stuff, because that's all I could afford. And it was good, but I needed to get to the majors, you know. So I ended up getting a – actually, my grandmother helped me get a real B3 and a real 122. That piece of gear has changed my life. Wow. Um, changed my life, absolutely. Michael Potter also asked are, through the years, and I'm really curious about this, have there been people that you couldn't work with because of scheduling, uh, lost opportunities that – you know how it is, it's – they're lost in the ether. It's we need you here. The two that I really miss is I had tickets to see Chicago when I was in with the Suns, and and somebody booked a Suns gig, so I couldn't go. And I had tickets to see Jimi Hendrix, and somebody booked a Sun gig, Suns gig, and I couldn't go. And I miss both. I miss the, the being able to see Terry Calf play, and I miss being able to see Jimi Hendrix play. What about gigs, though? He, I think he meant gigs. Was there ever a gig where we want you to play here, but you couldn't because of you were preoccupied with something else? Any musicians? Well, I mean, if if there was if there's a gig I couldn't make, usually it's because I was on another. I had another gig after the week where I was diagnosed with pretty major cancer. On Monday, my son died on Tuesday. I was on an airplane to Johannesburg, South Africa, because a friend had had booked me on a, a at a jet for two nights at a jazz festival in Johannesburg. I made the gig. I didn't make the rehearsal, but I made the gig because I told him. Yeah, I said, man, you're not going to believe this. He says, you want to bail on this? Well, I have to bail on the whole thing. I said, I don't want to do that to you. I'll go do the gig. And and luckily we were out. Uh, we were flying with Denise Williams, who's an old friend. I mean, I sang on one of her records, a couple of, couple of uh, songs on uh, One Love Keeps Calling album that actually David Foster produced. And uh, I get to sing with Maurice White on one date, you know, and, uh, and Brenda Russell, who I'd written with, and she's been an old pal for years and years. And, uh, and we, you know, they were like, here's your shoulder. You need it. You got it. You know what I mean? It was, it was really a rough, it was a, a rough run. I mean, I had pretty decent tickets, so I was able to, to spend the, spend the extra two hours or whatever in a, in a decent uh, business class lounge and that kind of thing. All of that was fine and dandy for this long a cruise. 
But I, the show kind of had to go on, you know. When I flew back, Tamara picked me up at the airport and we went right to a viewing at a mortuary when, with my son. So it was, it was a really rough time, you know. But I had a gig. I told him I'd play it. I played it. That's amazing. Holy God. 